my greetings of peace on all of you. Uh, I will request the distinguished panel to please uh, come up on the uh, stage and take their seats. Uh, I'll request uh, respected um, Sun Singh Sab, uh to please come up and uh, take your seat. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stephen, please come up. Uh, Mr. Uh, Nataranjan uh, Ayer, uh, President Jonathan, and Durji. Please, and then I will request respected uh, Imam Rabbani Saab to also join us on the stage. Jazakallah. With the recitation of the Holy Quran, I request uh, Ibrahim Chaudhary Sahib to please come up and recite uh, the verses of the Holy Quran. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, may the blessings of peace and blessings of God be on you. I'm going to recite a verse from the Holy Quran. Chapter 24, uh, Surah Al-Nur, uh, verse 36. A'uzu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Allah of the heavens and the earth. The similitude of his light is in a lustrous niche, wherein is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass, the glass is as it were a glittering star. It is lit from a blessed tree, an olive, neither of the east nor the west, nor of the west, whose oil would well nigh glow forth even through, though fire touched it not. Light upon light, Allah guides to his light whomsoever he will, and Allah sets forth parables to men, and Allah knows all things full well. Jazakallah. 
Um, we, the agenda today is uh, we'll have uh, welcome remarks uh, by the president of our Northern Virginia chapter. Um, um, and then afterwards we will have distinguished speakers uh, come up and provide their perspective on today's topic, which is how to connect with your God. Uh, we will have a keynote address with our respect, with, by a respected uh, Imam uh, Farhan Rabbani Sahib. And after that we'll have a half an hour Q&A uh, for the audience to ask any questions to our distinguished panel here. We'll, uh, we'll circulate this mic here, uh, uh, remote mic, uh, for the audience downstairs and then for uh, Lejna, uh, if the mic is working, they can ask their questions or they can text me the question as well. Uh, so with that, um, uh, I will request uh, respected Nadeem Khansa, who is the president of our Northern Virginia chapter, to please come up and address the audience. rahim <laughs> In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of God be upon you all. On behalf of Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, USA, and our Virginia chapters, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all in our beautiful Mubarak Mosque. Ahmadiyya Muslim Community is the oldest Muslim organization in USA. We have more than 73 chapters uh, in USA and it is established in more than 200 countries worldwide. In our tradition to promote the religious harmony and dialogue as well as understanding, we hold these meetings every year. And we also attend interfaith meetings throughout the year. We do these things to follow the commandment of God. And I'm going to briefly recite the translation of one of the verses from Holy Quran, the Holy Book, um, which, is, which directs us uh, to respect all the religions around us. So this is a translation from chapter 5, verse 49 from Holy Quran. And I quote, If God had so willed, he would have made you all one community. But he has not done so. In order that he may test you accordingly to what he has given you. So compete in goodness. I repeat, so compete in goodness. To God shall you all return, and He will tell you the truth about what you have been disputing. End of quote. May God Almighty help us to find the truth and keep us competing in goodness. I welcome you all to Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Our first speaker for this afternoon um, is Mr. Stephen Himstra. Um, he um, will provide the Christian perspective. Uh, Mr. Himstra is a volunteer pastor and a, Christ and a Christian author. His volunteer work is in Hispanic ministry, and he writes about Christian spirituality. Mr. Stephen worked as an economist for 27 years in more than five federal agencies where he published numerous government studies, magazines, art, magazine articles, and book reviews. Mr. Stephen has a Master's of Divinity from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in North Carolina. His doctorate is in Agricultural Economics from Michigan State. He studied in Puerto Rico and Germany. He speaks Spanish and German and reads Greek and Hebrew. I welcome Mr. Stephen.
good afternoon. This afternoon my topic is how do Christians communicate with God? How do we connect with God? Since today is Religious Founders Day, I take my inspiration from the words of the Apostle Peter speaking on the day the Christian Church was founded uh, over 2,000 years ago, a day which we call Pentecost. We pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I give a Christian perspective, let me start with a secular perspective on connecting with God. Secular people would say, if you talk to God, that's prayer. But if God talks to you, that's psychosis. Uh, in my, my memoir, which I published this past month, uh, called Along the Way, I make the point that anyone today in this uh, radical secular age who takes God seriously has to be considered a brother or sister in the faith. Um, and in that spirit, I want to thank the Mubarak Mosque for inviting me to speak here today. So how do Christians connect with God? Um, going to Peter's comments, Peter is addressing uh, several thousand people in Jerusalem after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's asked, uh, how can you be saved? And in this case, salvation means how can we be acceptable in God's sight and have God uh, care for us? And he, this is what Peter says. He says, repent to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In a similar context, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, I know most of you here today are not Christians, and so you probably are wondering, well, why do Christians obsess about this question of uh, confession of sin, and, and, and why are they so uh, obsessed with the person of Jesus Christ? Well, in order to understand the Christian perspective, you have to understand how Christians view God. Uh, the Christian view of God is that God is a personal God who is both transcendent and holy. Now, oftentimes there's a bit of confusion about transcendence, uh, but it's actually quite simple. If you turn to the very first verse in the Bible, uh, in the book of Gen Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, heavens and earth, there are two endpoints in creation, uh, which basically describe all of it. Uh, so God created the universe. Well, in order to create something, you have to exist before it was created. Uh, and you have to exist independent of it. And so we believe that God... Uh, stands outside of time and outside of space. And this poses a, a problem for us as human beings because uh, we're restricted to time and space. If God wanted to make an appointment with us at, you know, A.D. 5000, we'd say, well, gee, I, I can't make it, God. Or how about, you know, A.D. 0? Sorry, God, I can't make it. Uh, because we are restricted in time and space, we cannot approach God on our own. He has to reveal Himself to us. Well, Christians also believe that God is holy. And holiness has really two parts. The first part is it means sacred or valuable or precious. And the second part means uh, to be set apart. Okay, things that are precious, uh, things that are holy, things that are sacred. We, what do we do? We surround them with, with temples. We, we put them in, in safety deposit boxes. We post armed guards because we don't want thieving hands to get these holy things and we don't want them to be polluted by impurity. And so this poses a problem for us because as, as human beings we are sinful. And uh, we can't control that. We're born in sin. Uh, I used to joke in seminary that uh, original sin uh, was uh, 
two kids and one toy. Uh, this is part of what it means to be human. Well, so in summary, we have a holy God who is uh, outside of time and space, and we are unholy, and we are inside time and space. And so we cannot approach God on our own. He has to reach out to us. There are no paths up the mountain to God. He, he must come down. And as Christians, we believe he came down in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, this is not a new idea. In fact, it's a very, very old idea. Um, we know this because it's written about in the book of Job. The book of Job is, is part of the Bible, and it represents probably the oldest part of Scripture, um, at least 1,500 years before Christ, uh, having been written. And, and Christ, of course, lived 2,000 years ago. So we're talking about a piece of Scripture that is at least 3,500 years old. Listen to what Job says. He says, I know my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand upon the earth. And after his skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh will I see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. So the question that we have is, why would God care so much about us to reveal himself to us? Why, why would he do that? Um, well, we have kind of an answer that's given to us. Uh, God appeared to the prophet Moses uh, on Mount Sinai after he gave him the Ten Commandments. So God appears and he, he passes in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Well, notice, as in the Quran, we see that God is compassionate. And this is by his own words. Compassionate, merciful. These are two things that we oftentimes uh, talk about, but we, we, uh, we see this as God's self-proclamation -pro as to who he is. Well, as Christians, we believe that God was merciful to us in sending Jesus Christ to die on a cross for our sins so that we might be saved. Um, and so God has done this for us. We do not need to do anything except receive this gift of salvation. We have to accept it. Um, and so Christians don't practice animal sacrifices because we have the sacrifice of God himself in Jesus Christ. Well, listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the church at Corinth. For what I have received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve disciples. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. So we hear the echo of our original passage uh, with Peter. Let me read this one more time. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now this last part, the Holy Spirit, is terribly important, uh, because this is, the basic formula is that we have to admit our sin, God will forgive us through Jesus Christ, and then he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit who resides then in our hearts. And so we have like a telephone connection with God uh, every day. And so we know that when we pray, God will hear us. And we have confidence that when we read scripture, he will speak to us. And as we walk through life each day with the trials and tribulations, we know that God will be with us every step of the way. So as Christians, we are always connected to God. Will you pray with me? Oh dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. Forgive our sins and draw us closer to you day after day. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I finish, let me read just a, a brief piece from my book, uh, Life Intention. 
uh, this is a study of uh, the, the Beatitudes, which are the introduction to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But I'm reading for, from the acknowledgments here today. In the fall of 2014, I was invited to speak at a local mosque about my book, A Christian Guide to Spirituality. Speaking at a mosque was new to me, and anticipating my visit, I spent three days fasting and praying for guidance. Instead of guidance on the mosque visit, God inspired me to write this book. Well, as you might have guessed, this is the mosque that I'm speaking of, and this is the book which I give to you as a gift. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stephen. Our next speaker is Mr. Nataranjan Ayer. Uh, he came to the United States 20 years ago from India, a Brahmin Hindu by birth. Mr. Ayer has avid knowledge of Vedas and other advanced Hindu texts. He is fluent in Sanskrit, which is an ancient language that, that very few can speak and interpret. interpret. Mr. Ayer is a board member of Rajdhani Mandir, the largest Hindu Jain temple in the state of Virginia. His hobbies include teaching Vedas, yoga, and Hindu practices. With an MBA, he's also a well-seasoned management consultant with over tw two decades of experience. I invite Mr. Ayer on the stage. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk about Hinduism over here. How to connect to God? Hinduism is a religion based on centuries of thought on how to best connect with God in a manner that will serve not only yourself, but your family, your community, your world, and ultimately God. In fact, Hinduism is based on Advaita, a Sanskrit word, meaning that there is no line of separation between yourself and God. Your consciousness, your Atma, is God. There are myths about Hinduism that form of an idol worship or worship of innumerable deities. However, Hinduism uses the worship of deities as a tool to virtualizing the God in all things around us. If we point to you, point to you, can you see the God within them? No. The worship deities is a way to connect with a God in all of us. Connecting with God in Hinduism is as simple and as challenging as connecting with yourself in a spiritual way. Connecting with God is an evolutionary concept. Around 800 years ago, Hinduism was known as Sanatana Dharma, meaning timeless religion. <laughs> In 2500 BC, Swamis, the Rishis, we call it as the saints, taught the Vedas, the scriptures of uh, Hinduism, by teaching small number of children over 12 years and by pursuing an aesthetic life, life, lifestyle. The lifestyle renounces all worldly attachments and focus on connection with God as a means to fulfillment. Back then, Connection with God was formed through a memorization of the scriptures and a strict adherence to ancient traditions. However, in this current age, most of us do not have the period of 12 years to invest in Vedic education and do not seek mem memorize uh, Vedas. So, the current age, how do we connect with God? It's a challenge. Hindus believe that there is only one true God, the Supreme Spirit called Brahman. The Brahman has many forms, pervades the whole universe and is symbolized by the sacred symbol Om, with who without a beginning and without an end, who is beyond the mind and the senses, whose nature is bliss and oneness, who exists in all beings, in all exist. According to Hinduism, all life is sacred and every being in an aspect of God in a latent form. God creates the world and populates them with different beings for his own pleasure. A self-realized person is but God in human form. We are all human, we are all God by that way. 
God is incarnates upon earth from time to time to restore order and protect the weak and the meek from the evil. The fact that different gods are but aspects of one and the same God. Treat thy mother as a God. Treat the God, treat thou thy father. As a God, shalt thou treat the teacher. Thy guest as God shall through treat. That's one of the famous quote from the one of the Upanishads. We call it as Matru Devo Bhava, Pridha Devo Bhava, Acharya Devo Bhava, Aditi Devo Bhava. Hindus believe that Brahman is present in every person as the eternal spirit or soul called Atman. Brahman contains everything, creation, destruction, male, female, good, evil, movement, stillness. Hindus also worship several gods and goddesses. They are not different deities but different aspects of the same highest Brahman. In their deepest essence, they are same as Brahman. They also have some features or qualities or energies that distinguish from other divine, other divinities and which are essential to uphold the divine law or dharma we call it as. There is also a belief that gods of Hinduism including the Hindu trinity are advanced souls of previous cycles of creation and they are elevated as gods by virtue of their god gifts. The, there is another saying in the Vedas called Akashat Padidam Toyam Yada Gachadi Sagaram Sarvadeva Namaskar Keshavam Padigachadi. Just as the rainwater, wherever it falls, finally flows down into the ocean, so also the worship offered to any god will ultimately reach the Supreme God, which we call it as Brahman. The Bhakti tradition or the tradition which we call it as Bhakti in Hinduism is an explanation for this complicated theology of millions of gods. The easiest way to say that I found that in a country like US, we have millions, a government which employs millions of people, employees, government employees, to take care of a lot of departments to run a big government like this. So we treat all these small gods to Let's say you want to go to Fairfax County to a water authority, you have to go to the Fairfax Water Authority. Same way, we want to attain something, so you have a choice to reach to your own way to a God, to pray to them and get that peacefulness within you. As I always say, go back to that first word of the God is within you. You yourself is a God. Everybody has an Atman and everybody is a God. So every living being, a very non-living, a very thing which is moving, which is non-moving, we treat them as God. Let the peace be with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayer. Our next speaker is uh, from the Sikh community, Mr. Sant Singh. He's a software engineer by profession and a Punjabi teacher in the Punjabi school in the Gurdwara in Fairfax. I invite Mr. Singh to address us. Thank you very much, uh, my friends. Vai Guruji Ka Khalsa, Vai Guruji Ki Fateh. Um, first of all, when we say God, we, when we are saying God, what is God? So you, uh, nobody can describe God, right? God cannot be defined. In order to define something, we need to know what it is, right? So the learned people define the God in, by seeing the attributes of God. Like we say God is Rahim, because He do Rahim on you, He do mercy on you, that's why He is merciful. You say God is Bakshin, because He forgives your uh, actions, whatever the bad action you have done, do you call Him Bakshin? So similarly, all these names, Whatever the names we are going to give, like Ram, because he is pervading everywhere, Ramya Haya Ram. That means God is pervading everywhere. People call him Ram. So, uh, what I mean to say is that when we are uh, trying to talk about God, we are talking about some attributes of God. If, because God cannot be uh, envisioned or uh, into our like mind. Our mind is too small to grasp with the concept of God. So, how we are going to uh, reach God if we don't even know what God is? God is beyond our senses. In Gurbani, Guruji says that God is Agam. Agam means who cannot be reached. 
and God is a gocher. A gocher means beyond our senses. You can't see him, you can't hear him, you can't touch him, you can't feel him. So how are you going to approach God? So if you don't know even what the entity is. So for that you need Guru. Guru comes, Guru is the uh, human form of like the, uh, when Guru Nanak came, Guru Nanak told us the way how to connect with God. And Guru Nanak gave the Guruship to the next Guru, Guru Angad Dev Ji and uh, after 10th ten Guru, the same Guru Jyot was given to Shri Guru Granth Sahib Ji, our holy book, Shri Guru Granth Sahib Ji. It is different from other religions because other religions they treat the, these books just like book. For us, it's Guru. Guru, because Guru himself have given the authority to that Shri Guru Granth Sahib Ji to be the Guru of the Sikh. So, then we have to understand what is the purpose of our life, why we came here in this world. So, have you ever thought about it, why you came to this earth? Guru says, Man tu jod surup hain. Oh my mind, you are the embodiment of divine light. Apna mool pachan. Recognize your roots. Man harji tere naal hai. Oh my mind, the Lord is always with you. Gurmati rang maan. With Guru's instructions, Guru's teachings, follow, enjoy the love of the Lord. And then Guruji says that Farida jinni kammi nahe gun te kamade visar. Sheikh Farid ji says that whatever the actions, there is no value in it. Why are you wasting your time in it? Leave those kamade means leave those actions. Matashar minda thiwai sain de darba. So that you don't have to be ashamed in the court of the Lord. So do the actions which will take you towards the God. Whatever the actions are taking you away from God, avoid those actions. And then when we talk about um, how to connect with God, then there is a process involved. We, we have the process, technology and the resources. And Guruji talks about the process. Um, process is simply... Uh, uh, like we have uh, three pillars of Sikhis called Naam, Daan, Ishna. Naam means you have to be um, mindful awareness of Lord all the times. So whenever you do go anywhere, wherever, whatever you do, always remember the Lord into your mind. So whatever the action you do, remember that God is watching you. So when you have that type of feeling, you will not be doing anything bad. Then the next concept is uh, Daan. Daan means altruism. Whatever you have, whatever the gifts the God have given you, share with the community. You have, you know how to drive a taxi, teach somebody. You know how to do programming, teach somebody. You have the money, you can share the money with the needy. So that's, that's the concept of Daan. Whatever you have, share it with others. And then the next concept is Ishnan. Ishnan means, literally it means that cleansing act. It's not like uh, uh, cleaning your body. By taking bath, you can clean your body. But you cannot clean your mind with that. In order to clean your mind, you have to um, do some mind uh, cleansing activities, right? Guruji says, Man mele sab kish mele tan to tai man hachan hoi. Guruji says, if your mind is bad, your mind is corrupted, whatever you do will be corrupted. The, the whole world is wondering what is Ishnan. People are just doing, taking baths here and there. Guruji says that that will not wash your mind. Your mind has to be cleaned with God's name. You have to have the um, mindful awareness of God in everything, whatever you do. So and then Guruji also gives the stages of life. So whatever you you are doing, like if you are building a house, you need to know where we are. It will take six months, right? After three months, you ask the builder, where are we? He said 50% done. So in the, similarly, whenever you are following some process, a spiritual process, you need to know where you are. Guru Nanak Dev Ji has defined the, um, these milestones, we call it Panj Khand. First Khand is Taram Khand. In the Taram Khand, Taram Khand means duties and responsibilities. Whatever the duties and responsibilities are given to you, uh, you have to follow those uh, uh, nicely. So basically whatever you do, performing all your duties according to the Gurmat, with the high level of integrity, love, humility and respect for all beings of various types, names, colors and religions. People may have various ways of worshipping God. That doesn't mean that they are different. We are all the children of the same God, right? So 
once the person accepts the Guru as his leader or guide and after that he starts following these, this is the first stage. In the second stage is called Gyan Khand. In the Gyan Khand, what does it mean is the complete understanding of life's purpose. As I told, why are we, um, can, why, why did we come to this earth? What is the purpose of our life? How we are going to connect with the Lord? Ask yourself these type of questions. So, in the Gyan Khand, awareness of the limitless Lord, innumerable devotees, servants, deities, demons, creatures, they have various languages, actions guided by the divine knowledge. So, in, in this stage, the person's actions, whatever the action that person is doing, those are guided by the divine awareness, divine uh, knowledge, not by superstitions or anything like that. So we, we, uh, that person will not follow rituals or superstitions. Everything will be guided by knowledge. And next stage is Saram Khan. In the stage of Saram Khan, that is affirmative actions to meet the Lord. So when you, you know that this is how you are going to uh, meet God, then you have to do some actions also to meet God. So in this case, living the truthful and purposeful life according to Gurmat. And then complete, uh, inner consciousness, intellect and the mind is molded afresh by Gurmat. Before that you are living by your own ways. Now you started living according to what Guru says. So you, you started your living the life according to that. And Shram literally means that uh, it's a Sanskrit word, Shram. Shram means doing actions. So after, after you learn that, uh, this is how I am going to get there and then you start taking actions for that. When you are actually doing those actions to meet God, though that's the stage of Sharam Khan. Then next stage is Karam Khan. Karam Khan is, Karam is Persian word. So if Karam is, you, you say that Allah ka karma ho gaya. Bakshish. Meher ho gaya Allah. So that means that all the actions, whatever you are doing, all the um, prayers you are doing, whatever the things you are doing, those God accepted in the God's court. And then when he do the grace, the, the Lord have became merciful on you, the Lord bestows such a grace that the mind becomes fearless. Because now you understand that everything is belongs to God. God is above everybody, right? So if God have made everybody, so everybody is my brothers and sisters. The, the, then you will see the divine light in each and everybody. So at that stage, the person will see the presence of God in each and every individual. The last stage is called Sachkhand. Sachkhand is the perfect union with the Lord. When that person is fully absorbed in the Lord's love, that is called Sachkhand stage. Completely merged with the Lord like a river merges with the ocean. And then sees the Lord's order pervading everywhere in the innumerable worlds, solar systems and universes. And now, without any limits or boundaries, Stage, this stage is beyond description. Guruji says that describing this stage is like describing God. In the human languages, it cannot be described. It's like eating the iron ball. You can eat it, right? Similarly, you cannot describe this stage. This is too high stage for a human to describe. So, when I talk about universes, so you may say that we have only one universe. Science says that there is one universe. Up to now, the science reach is up to 96 billion light years. That's the width of uh, observable universe. But Guruji says it's not one universe. There are universes upon universes. There are more universes. If you, uh, at this time, there is a scientist uh, named Stephen Haik um, Hawkins. If you hear him, he gave the theory that the black holes have the ability to give birth to new universes. And th there is a Japanese scientist who also discovered there are universes beyond our universe. So when we say our current science reach is 96 billion light year, up beyond that they cannot see anything because the light has not came to earth yet. Now when we say 96 billion light year, it's the distance, it's not, uh, light's speed is 300 kilometers per second. So whatever the time it will take, for the light to travel, that's called a light year. So it's 96 billion light year. Up to that distance, the science has reached. They say that that's the observable universe. When we say observable universe, that doesn't mean that it's the limit of universe. That means that they can see up to that distance. Universe is there beyond that also. So what I point I am trying to make is that Lord is unlimited. So um, you, if you try to define, if you try to find his limits, it will be foolish action. So don't try to define. Guruji says, 
तुम दरियाओ दाना बीना मैं मछली कैसे अंत लाऊ इट्स लाइक ओ माय लॉर्ड यू आर लाइक एन ओशन एंड आई एम जस्ट ए फिश हाउ कैन आई फाइंड यूर बाउंड्स सो इंस्टेड ऑफ ट्राइंग टू फाइंड द बाउंड्स ऑफ द लॉर्ड try to enjoy if the fish enjoys the water it can swim here and there enjoy the ocean right but if the fish tries to find the extent of lord it will be waste his time of for that so these are the um, major concepts of the sikhi so then uh, in in six scriptures six scripture define our day to day routines also like whatever we are supposed to do uh, in uh, wake up in the amrit vela you call it alal subha and uh, in the amrit vela we wake up do uh, read gurbani um, in the similarly we we do um, in the afternoon we, um, about 6 o'clock or something we do rahra sai part that's the evening prayers and then before night we do kirtan swala just like you have panch navas we have three times for the re- recital of the bands so sheikh farida to say uth farida sutya uju uth farida uju saaj subah namaz guja जो सिर साई ना निवे सो सिर कप उतार फ्री जी सेज दैट इफ यू आर ए ट्रू मुस्लिम वेक अप इन अर्ली ओम अब्रोशियल आवर्स इन इन अर्ली मॉर्निंग एंड डू वुड यू सार वॉश योर हैंड्स फीट एंड फेस एंड देन आफ्टर दैट डू नमाज एंड देन ही फर्दर सेज दैट बे नवाजा कुत्या ए ना पली रीत इफ ए मुस्लिम डज नॉट डू नमाज Fried ji says that that is just like the uh, dog's life. So every Muslim must do namaz. So basically, in, in you can notice that in Shri Guru Granth Sahib ji, there is the bani of Sheikh Fried ji, there is the bani of uh, Hindu saints. So um, when we are talking about that, uh, all these saints, sages, they are enlightened souls. so they are just like equal to the gurus so whenever they say we are supposed to follow we we equally respect sheikh fried as we respect guru nanak or uh, kabir ji so um i think my time is up so in your quick q and a session if there are more questions i would, i would be happy to answer thank you very much thank you very much mr singh um i would like to uh is here and not clapping this is not a tradition to clap uh, in the mosque however we do appreciate and uh, your perspective and they are very much involved in what you're all saying i'm already getting some questions based on some of the things that our speakers have been mentioning so thank you very much for doing that i just wanted to make sure that it's not out of disrespect it is out of the respect of the mosque <coughs> our next uh, speaker is uh, from the buddhist uh, perspective uh, mr dulji Damdol, and he will talk to us uh, about his perspective on how to connect with your God. Good afternoon. It is said that uh, there are more than seven billion human beings on this planet. and uh, all of this seven billion human beings i'm sure that we all have a different mental dispositions and uh, we have all kind of uh, illness disease and the problems so like there are many diseases diseases or illness that we are facing we have different medicines to cure them so what i believe he is that like Uh, there are many kind of people, and uh, all these uh, different kind of people they need different villages because it will fit and suitable for different people. So therefore, uh, I see that there is a common ground in all the major traditions, and therefore I would like to appreciate the organizers uh, of this uh, interfaith dialogue on this villages on the day. I like to brief by bringing. Uh, peoples from different faiths and uh, discuss on our uh, belief it helps to promote understanding create awareness and bring cooperation um, so all i stress that the fundamentals are the same in all the religions 
Christianity, Muslims, uh, Buddhist, Sikh, or Hindus, their fundamentals are the same love, compassion, and so on. Uh, and, but I think our destination is the same, but we have a little different approach. So while we have the same common ground, today I will focus on certain differences because the differences come in the way of how we connect to God. That is the topic of our uh, discussion today. And uh, in Buddhism, uh, there is no belief uh, in a divine creators or the almighty uh, God. Uh, instead, there is the core principle of causality or the law of causality, uh, which is uh, uh, known as karmas, which also means actions through our body, speech, mind, and the consequences of this act. So what can be said about Buddhism in connecting with God is that Buddhism is not about beliefs, but it is about practice, not about what we think and believe, but what we do and how we live. So when I say that, I have to talk about uh, the four uh, fundamentals of, Tibet, uh, of Buddhism, which is taught by Lord Buddha. And when I talk about the four fundamentals, which is known as uh, four noble truth. So in four noble truth, Lord Buddha, 2,500 years ago, he was an ordinary person. Initially, he was an ordinary person. He was actually a princess. So around the age of 26, he renounced his worldly uh, existence, uh, livings, and uh, went out and meditated, and that's how he became, inter uh, he became enlightenment. He became the Buddhas. And so what he said 2,500 years ago is that, I teach suffering its origin, the succession, and the path that is all I teach. So the Four Noble Path is very simple. So what the Four Noble Path is, the truth, the first truth of Four Noble Truth is that the truth of suffering, the truth, the second Noble Truth is the truth of the origin of sufferings. And then the third truth is the truth of cessation of suffering. And the fourth truth is the truth of path to the succession of sufferings. So I need to elaborate a little bit on each of them because this was the first sermon that Lord Buddha has given to his uh, uh, five student monks in a place called Deer Park in India. And uh, this is the fundamental concepts taught in Tibetan Buddhism. So when we talk about uh, the first truth, which is that suffering exists. So this is uh, beautifully illustrated uh, in Lord Buddha's uh, story itself. So one day Lord Buddha, or at that time he's known as uh, Siddhartha, he walked, he took a journey out of his palace because uh, so far the kings tried to uh, confine him in his palace. But he ventured out, and then what he saw that changed him. And what he saw is that the first three signs that he came across are sickness, uh, old age, and death. So he was asking questions, is there a solution to that? Do we all human beings have to go through this sufferings? So that is the first uh, uh, sufferings, and this is the, the most important one. Uh, but however, that there are many other sufferings uh, we can talk about, such as pain, and then uh, our own human nature is uh, imperfect, so therefore we always have sufferings. But then what Lord Buddha realizes that the suffering arises from our attachment to desire, such as a, a craving, a sensual pleasures, and the fame and fortunes. So he understood what is the causes, the 
origin of these sufferings. And uh, when he talks about this, uh, the uh, causes of suffering, he talks about the three root evils, which are also called as the three dark, the three fires. It's just symbolized in Buddhist by greed, ignorance, and hatred. And so, when he realized that, once he realized that there is uh, uh, the origins of the sufferings, the cause of the sufferings, he realized that there is a, a, a method, there is a solution to these sufferings. So the solution is that suffering or suffering can be uh, stopped uh, when we attain our nirvanas or when we liberate ourselves from all the worries and troubles and all kind of attachments. So in a way, when desire ceases, that's when we are liberated and that's when we can attain uh, enlightenment and Buddhahood. And so how he, we can attain Buddhahood or enlightenment, and the fourth, then that's explained by the fourth noble truth. The fourth noble truth which says that freedom from suffering is possible by practicing what is called the Eightfold uh, Path. And the Eightfold Path tells us how we can reach uh, Nirvana. So when we talk about eight uh, path for uh, this is a path, we talk about such as like right way, right intentions, right speech, uh, right actions, right livelihood, right uh, efforts, right mindfulness, right concentration, and so on. So not only that he realized that there is uh, uh, sufferings, he realized there is the origin of these sufferings, that there is a cure for this suffering, and then he prescribes the solutions or uh, suggestions for these sufferings, and which is comes in the eight pathfold, and which is a little detail. What I'm just touching right now is a very uh, uh, the basic and just the tip uh, of an iceberg, and we can go very in depth in those things. Uh, just to help to understand the very basic of uh, uh, Buddhist uh, teachings, and this four noble truth is uh, by giving you an analogies and examples. So the Buddha is often often compared to uh, physicians, to doctors. So in the first two noble truth, he was about to diagnose the problems or the sufferings and identify its causes. And then the third noble truth is the realization that there is a cure. And then the fourth noble truth in which he set out the eightfold path is the prescriptions by way you can be relieved from sufferings. So I think this analogy may help you to understand a little more as what uh, Buddha talks about it. So as you can see, the Buddhist concept of God may be a little different from uh, other concepts of God. So when we talk about God, it is not only God, Buddha, he is the uh, God, that there are three uh, ways by which we take refuges, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sanghas. So Buddha is the one who is enlightened, the awakened one, and Dharma is the teaching that he preached, and the Sanghas are the devoted uh, Buddha, the communities or the monks who preach and promote this his religions. So uh, sometimes myself uh, is also um, uh, don't have answers to all the questions that I have when studying the uh, Buddhism. Because when you understand, when you say, okay, what is the end of nirvana? What is the end of enlightenment? We say, okay, you will achieve nirvana. But uh, the nirvana is uh, understood to be a state of mind that human can reach. And it is a state of uh, uh, profound spiritual joy without any negative and uh, fears. So uh, it is difficult to say that Nirvana is something completely uh, different realms where we wish dies and so on. However, anyone who is attained Nirvana is known to be filled with the compassion for all living beings. Uh, so uh, in the eightfold path, uh, 
note that uh, primarily outlines the importance of ethical contact, the important, uh, importance of wisdoms, as well as the, uh, the practice, which is meditation. So I am just summing up, that is the eighth path, which shows you how to attain Nirvana or how to reach the uh, Buddhahood. And uh, uh, I, com uh, I completely agree that uh, uh, in Buddhism, that uh, you are your own enemy and you are also your own saviors. So there is no judgment days as in any other beliefs. So you can be responsible for your own actions and your comments will, uh, will, uh, uh, will come back in that. And I would like to end it with one uh, short story. And uh, this uh, uh, story kind of illustrates about uh, Buddhist attitudes toward life and how to be uh, taking a middle path without being too extremes in both view. And uh, so this story goes like this. Uh, once there was a Chinese farmer uh, who bought his poor farm together with his son and their only horse. And when the horse ran off, ran off one day, the neighbors comes and say, how unfortunate you are. The farmer replied, maybe yes, maybe not. When the horse returns, followed by a herd of wild horses, the neighbors gather around and, uh, and exclaim, what good luck for you. The farmers stay calm and say, maybe yes and maybe not. While well, trying to tame one of the wild horses, the farmer's son fell and broke his legs. And then the neighbors come back again and say, how sad you are. And they say, it's very unfortunate of you. And then the farmer said again, maybe yes, maybe not. However, shortly after, a neighboring army threatened to invade the farmer's village. So all the young able-bodied persons in that village were drafted to fight against the invaders. And many died. But the farmer's sons left out of the fighting and because of his broken leg. So people come and say, what a good thing that you could, your sons couldn't, uh, didn't have to go to the fight. And the farmer said, maybe yes, maybe not. So anything could happen in life and one of the most attitudes, uh, uh, views we have in our life is to have a, a, a shining extremes following the middle path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Duji. Uh, our next speaker, um, John Dersh, he is the president uh, of the, in the second councilor in Central India presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, which cons constitutes of nine congregations. His responsibilities involve training local congregation leaders, um, doctrinal teachings, overseeing of all youth and children program, public affairs, athletic activities. He has previously served as a bishop of the local congregation as well. Uh, he, by profession, Mr. Jonathan, is a certified public accountant, and he lives in Centerville, Virginia. It's great to be here. Um, we've had a wonderful relationship with you in the mosque. Um, I certainly want to welcome Elon Farhan Rabani. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. We look forward to getting to know you, and we hope you will be welcome here in the area. Um, we, uh, I'm just delighted to to be here and maybe have just a chance to make a few remarks. Um, both, you know, Stephen and I are, are of the Christian um, view, and 
so, and, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, what most of us call us Mormons. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the official name of the church. And uh, I echo a lot of things that Stephen said. I think he did a great job in talking about the importance we, we put on Jesus Christ and how he's essential in our view and in our, in our belief of coming to God. He helps us reconcile to God through his atonement. From the uh, Mormon perspective, um, I want to just talk about just a few the things I hope you'll find a little interesting. Really, I would summarize the connection with God uh, for us as really four things. First, faith. First faith. The first principle we believe of the gospel is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And second, repentance. Third, baptism. That's kind of an interesting one. Um, but baptism for the remission of sins and for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Stephen talked about that, the importance of that. So faith. We believe that uh, the scriptures say, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So faith is something that we cannot see, but is true. And faith ultimately is moves us to action. And so when we think about connecting with God, our first step is to learn about him, his attributes, his characteristics. And probably the most fundamental, I know there's lots of fathers here, and have sons, and how much you love those sons. That is the first attribute of God, that he is our father, and that he loves us. And that is the essential characteristic of God, and the great characteristic. And so, we um, know that, and so we can trust him. And we also know that we believe that he's all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-wise. He is just, he's perfectly just, perfectly merciful. And as we learn these attributes, we're able then to rely on him and trust him. And so as we listen to the words, uh, God's words, that we, you know, we believe constitutes God's words, then we act on those. And that is faith. And when we do that, then God reveals himself to us, little by little, as we trust in that which we cannot see that is true. And so that's, that's the first step, and we can, and we can feel and have experiences with our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Then when we have that faith, then we're supposed to do something with it, of course, and repentance. Well, what repentance is, is change. Well, you know, sometimes we got bad habits and we need to change. And that is an essential thing for us to do. Um, this, the Bible says that if you love me, keep my commandments. And we believe that, uh, that by keeping God's commandments, we show that we love him, but that requires us to change and conform to those. And so one of the ways we do that is through baptism. And the reason baptism is so important, it's, it's really representative of a covenant with God. And so a covenant is really just a two-way promise, a two-way promise. And in that promise, may, uh, we promise to do something, and God promises to do something. God always sets the terms of the covenant. And so we believe that through God's words, we're able to understand what that covenant is, and it's basically this. Keep the commandments for the rest of your life and serve others. Very simple. And so uh, we do that, and that's all part of the covenant. And God promises us that he will guide and direct us and speak to us. And that's how we connect with him. If we keep our part of the covenant. So we, we do that. He also covenants to forgive us through the Savior Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins. And so as we keep those covenants. 
finally, the last part is the Holy Ghost. But as we have those covenants, we receive the Holy Ghost. And that can be with us all the time. Now, we believe that everyone can feel the Holy Ghost, actually. You don't have to have covenants with God to feel the Holy Ghost. But what we believe is the difference is, is when you receive those covenants, then you get it in more abundance. You have it all the time if you keep your covenants, which helps you in everything you do. And so, I, I keep telling my wife that uh, I, got, I, I met her because I was inspired to find her, <laughs> which I believe is true. And so, we can, receive, uh, we can receive personal guidance. I just want to end on this, maybe this note. I was driving home one day, the importance of these covenants and one of the results of it, and how the Holy Ghost kind of works. I was driving home one day, and I was ahead of the, I was the bishop of the congregation, and the bishop has the responsibility really to minister to everybody in need, and he has lots of people to help him. I was tired, it had been a long day, I think I'd been up, you know, 14, 13 hours, I wanted to go home and see the kids. As I was driving home, I got this feeling and prompting that said, you need to go visit so-and-so before you go home. And so, I had to hear it again. You need to go visit so-and-so before you go home. And so I did. I turned around and went and visited. And this person was in dire need of some help. And it was just at the right time. You know, you've been in those situations where you're there to the right place at the right time. It was one of those. And so that... That is it. And so service to others is essential. We believe if you're in the service of your fellow beings, you're in the service of God. The scripture, what the scripture says, For how knoweth the man the master whom he hath not served, and is far from the thoughts and intensities of his heart? We believe to know God and to connect with him, we have to love and serve one another. I think your community has been a great example to us about that. You've been of service to us, and we've got to work with you. And I want to thank you personally, just at the end of my remarks, and uh, look forward to answering any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Jonathan. Um, this brings us uh, to the completion of our speakers uh, that provided different perspectives. Uh, based on their religious beliefs on how to connect with, with your God. Um, we now have a keynote address from our respected uh, Imam Farhan Rabbani Sahib, after which we'll have a Q&A um, session for the audience. And so I'll request respected Imam Farhan Rabbani Sahib to address us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings of God, your mighty be upon you all. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim First and foremost, I wanted to say Jazakallah and thank you to the organizers of today's event. The topic that I am going to present on today and my predecessors have presented is how to connect with your God. In Arabic language, the language of the holy scripture of Muslims, the phrase which is used to describe how to connect with your God is called Talub Billah, connecting with your creator, connecting with your God, connecting with Allah. This word Ta'alluq which is connection or attachment, comes from the Arabic word root, which is called alaq. God says in the Holy Quran, خلق الانسان من alaq. That we have created human beings from alaq. Now alaq is that phase of 
a child's birth or conception, when the fetus is the when the fetus is literally in the form of a clot of blood attached to the womb. And because of that attachment to the womb, the word alaq is used. But then there is another meaning of the word alaq. Alaq means to love something, to belong to something, to get attached, latch on to something. Which is why in Arabic language there is this phrase that says that if you're walking and a thorn gets stuck to your clothes, the phrase which is used to, you know, explain that situation is alaq. All the world religions claim that God exists. If God truly exists, then the next question, the concomitant question is going to be, is He achievable? Meaning, can you attain God's love? Can you attach yourself with Him? And would He attach Himself with you? In other words, Talub Billah. And all the world religions who say that God exists, they also say the second part, the latter part. That yes, you can find God, you can reach God. Look, it says in the Holy Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَاهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا He or she who strives in my way for my love in order to attach to me will be helped by me, says God in the Holy Quran. If God truly does exist, then the biggest achievement, the biggest goal for any individual would be to belong to God and for you to have His love in your life. And this is the purpose of our creation. As God said, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنَ اللَّهِ That Allah has placed this, this phenomena innately in every soul that that soul wants to belong to someone. That someone is God. There is this famous story about a Muslim sage. You know, my, my Sikh colleague talked about Baba Friji's quote regarding getting up, getting up in the middle of the night to pray. So there was this Muslim sage, this mystic, this Sufi. He used to wake up in the middle of the night for tahajjud prayer and he would spend hours worshipping his God. Until one day in his neighborhood moved in a man who liked to party. And you know how we say here in this society, you know, you party really hard. That's how this man was. He used to party real hard. Every night there would be music blasting. And obviously this, this Sufi saintly man, his worship was disturbed. He would not be able to concentrate in his worship of his creator. So he approached his neighbor in the most politest manner and said, Look, sir, it is my humble request to you if you could please you know, keep the music level low. It hinders in my worship. Now somehow this man took offense. He was connected to the king of the time. So he went to the king and said, O oh king, I have been disgraced. I have been dishonored by my neighbor. And this is what's happening. So the king sent about hundred men and said, I'm going to send hundred men who are going to be guard posted on your door. This man came back all hofty and thinking, all right, let me now go and approach this, you know, this man. So he went to his neighbors and said, you know, you, you had a complaint against me? Guess what? I am connected to the king. I am connected to the king and not only that I am connected to the king, he has sent hundred men to guard me. If you have the means and power to fight us, come and fight us. So this Sufi man said, Look, I am an old man. 
I don't have the means and the power to fight you and the king's men. But I'm also not going to give a fight. But I'm going to fight you in a way that I am well versed in. I'm going to fight you by praying to my God. Now this man had some fear in him. He stayed quiet for a little bit and then he started crying. He started trembling. And he said, please forgive me, sir. From now on, I shall not play any music at night time. Because me and the king's men do not have the power to fight your God. If God exists and you can somehow connect with him and he connects with you, then nothing else would matter. Because now you have everything. In Holy Quran and the Islamic scripture, the word love, you know, the word love is an English word and Quran is in Arabic. So Quran has used different words to explain what love truly is. And in order to make things easily understandable for everyone, I have divided these words into five stages. So five words appear, five words appear in the Holy Quran and the sayings of Holy Prophet, Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One the very first word which appears is Raghba. In Arabic language, Raghbat is when you become inclined towards someone. And this is the least form of love. When you become inclined towards someone, you want them. This is called love. This is called rahbat. Then the next step is that the person whom you like, whom you desire, that person has also developed a minimal interest in you and is now facing you. So the word in Arabic which is used to describe this stage is called uns, from which the word insan comes. Wherein the person who desires God is looking towards God and now God is also looking towards him or her. So this stage is called uns. You know, for example, this microphone is facing me. So this is my anis. Anis means facing something. And this podium is facing you. So this podium is your anis. And then the third and the higher step is wood. Wood comes from the Arabic word wudud, which means wood literally means watad. Watad is a spike, you know, a long nail that you can drive in the ground and it doesn't let anything move away from it. This is called wood or watad, and from it comes the word wudud. So, this is that form of love where God's love is has entered your heart like a spike. Nothing is moving now. It's there now. And God has strong love for you as well. But remember at each step, God's love for us is going to be greater than the love we have for our Creator. The fourth, second highest step is Hub, which means love. And in Arabic we use the word Muhabba. Muhabba means a seed which takes place or which is sown in the earth of our heart and as a result a tree, a plant takes form. This is the next step when you love God and then the ultimate step is Khalil. In Arabic we say Khalil as in a friend, like as in it appears for Abraham, Ibrahim Islam. regarding him it says Ibrahim Khalilullah, the friend of God. But do you know in Arabic, the word Khalil actually stems from the root Khullatun. And Khulla literally means your pores. Pores through which you sweat and all the toxins, you know, they exit your body. So this is that form of love, that level of love, that stage of love, where God enters through every single pore of your body where he becomes solely yours and you become solely his. 
And this is how God has explained the concept of love for God in Islam. Now, for a person who wants to connect with his or her creator, the two things that person must do and must not do. Let's talk about the must not do part of this equation. In this part of the equation, there are 10 things, 10 kinds of attributes. If a person has any one of them, or two of them, or three of them, or all of them, such a person cannot love God, and God will not love such a person. And our intellect, our rationale supports this. Those 10 attributes are, number one, arrogance. Someone who thinks that I am so big that nothing can touch me. I'm immune. I'm perfect. Nothing can come close to me. A person that is arrogant will not be able to humble himself or herself. And henceforth will not be able to see the favors of God. Number two, proudness, to feel proud that I have such attributes, such qualities, such skills that other people don't have those. Such a person, again, would lack humility. Number three, is such people who become motadeen. In Arabic, motadeen are those who exceed bounds. For example, somebody slaps me. Islam gives me the right to defend myself, to retaliate equally. But imagine if I start saying, all right, now that you have slapped me, may you be damned in this life and hereafter. And even when you die, I don't want it to end right there. I want your tombstone to say that you're a son of such and such and such, all profanity. I don't want it to end there. I want you to be damned in the afterlife in such a way that nobody has been punished in a similar fashion. This is Mu'tad, someone who exceeds all bounds. And then the fourth kind of attribute that one must avoid is Khaban in Arabic language, which comes from the root Khayn, a dishonest person. The fifth one is Athim. Athim in Arabic language means a person who is habitual in committing sin in breaking laws of the country and, of course, the law of God. And number six is someone who is Fareh. Fareh in Arabic language is someone who becomes extremely joyful, extremely joyous upon receiving little, little things and thinks that, okay, now that I have achieved this much success, I'm the big shot. I got everything. Such a man can never contemplate on God. Such a man can never, or such a woman can never understand the favors of God. Because in her and in his mind, the goal is very minimal. God says you should aim for the stars. The next point, attribute number seven, is Mufsid. Mufsid is someone who creates disorder in the land. Someone who creates disorder. Among the creation of God, how can such a person claim that he or she loves God? Number eight is someone who is ungrateful. Someone who is ungrateful to mankind can never be grateful to God either. Look, it's very simple. God, regarding God, one must keep two things in mind. Or regarding love, one must keep two things in mind. <coughs> You love someone either because of their beauty, which is called husn in Arabic, or you love someone because of their ihsan, the good things, the favors that they have rendered for you. And these are the two things that create love in someone's heart for you. And these are the two things because of which you may love someone. When human beings love someone, for example, a man loves his wife, in the beginning, this creation, this connection of love starts with beauty, husn, because the man sees the beauty in his wife, and that's where the love begins. But then over time, that love is replaced, the love of beauty is replaced by the love of ihsan, 
the good deeds. You know, a very interesting example was given by the second caliph to the Prophet Muhammad Hazrat Sahib Dada Mirza Bashir Uddin Mahmud Ahmad Radiallahu Anhu, may God be pleased with him. In his speech, which is titled exactly the same topic as today's uh, program, Talib Bil. He says, look, when two people get married, in the beginning the man loved his wife because his wife was pretty. And after 50, 60, 70 years of marriage, now the woman is 80, 90 years of age and the man is 95. Draw a picture or take a picture of that old woman and then go and show to a young person and say, would you marry this woman? Would you fall in love with this woman as a spouse? That young boy will say or that young man will say, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Her eyebrows are all sad. Her face is saggy. There's nothing to love in her. You ask her husband now the same question. He would say, I would die for her in a heartbeat. As a matter of fact, now his love for his wife is even greater than the point when he started to love his wife in the beginning of their relationship. So with human beings, this is how love works. That first you love somebody because of their beauty and then you develop the love because of their ihsan, which is good deeds. But with God, it works the opposite way. In, with God, we start to love God because His favors upon us. And once you love Him because of that, then you truly start to see the beauty of God. And that's when you see the husn of God. Point number nine was, one must avoid, is being a musrif. Musrif is someone, according to Arabic language, who spends, overspends. Overspends on his wants. Not the needs, but on his wants. To such a person, his wants are greater than the need of a poor person who doesn't even have anything to eat or drink or to even clothe himself. And then the last attribute that one must avoid, and God does not love those people who have these attributes, is zalim, someone who is cruel. In Arabic language, the definition of the word zulm <coughs> is that you put something where it doesn't belong and this person who is cruel how is he cruel? he is cruel in one sense among other things he gives precedence to himself over everybody else to him he is the center of attention the focal point of the entire universe someone who has these ten Attributes or even one of them cannot love God and God will not love him back. So someone who does not have these ten attributes doesn't mean that automatically that person loves God. It simply means that now that person is ready to develop a connection with God. So then here comes the main part. What does Islam teach about connecting with God? So I'm going to present ten points and all of these points that so far I have mentioned have been taken straight from the Holy Quran and the Ahadith, the sayings of Prophet Muhammad The 10 ways to develop love for God The first one is that you remember His attributes For example, we say that God is merciful God is great, Allahu Akbar He is the greatest He is the highest, Allahu A'la Allahu Al-Azim Subhan, He is holy All these different attributes, you remember them Day in, day out. Somebody may say, somebody may say, what's the point of just parroting these names? You know, there's a story of a man in ancient Arabia. He fell in love by listening to a story that people were saying to one another. In other words, you know, just for you to understand, maybe I could say that a person who listens to the story of Romeo and Juliet and falls in love with the concept of Julia. So many people here in the West, in the East, wherever you go, they read these love novels because by reading these things, repeating these themes over and over again, they start to fall in love. Napoleon, regarding Napoleon Bonaparte, has mentioned that he had love novels that he would read. Regarding many great generals, it is mentioned that at the time of battle, they would take these love poem sonnets 
these love novels with them. <coughs> the second point is fikr, ponder. Not just recite these names of God, but think about them. God is creator. How is he creator for you? God is satar. He covers the faults. How does he cover the faults of you? God is merciful. He forgives. How has he forgiven you? And how are you forgiving other people? Point number three is to become a Muslim, to do good things for the creation of God. You know, my, my um, colleagues have mentioned about this part as well, that it's about worshipping God, serving God, and serving His creation. Islam says the same thing. Because we are from the same source, the divine source, hence we, find, we have the similarity. You do good things. And this is why... Regarding Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it says in the Holy Quran, La Allah tabakhru nafsaka Allah yakunu mumineen. Oh Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are you going to die? Are you going to die because these people are not believing in God? <coughs> then the fourth point is to become repentant. Someone who becomes who, who commits a sin or an error, but then realizes that he or she made a mistake and repents. God says in the Holy Quran, Inna Allah God loves those who repent. Number five are those who pray to God. Those who pray to God. And they have this firm faith that whatever we're going to achieve are we're going to achieve through the power of prayer. That our Lord listens to the prayer. Ujibu da'an that he listens to prayer whenever a person, his servant, prays to him. Number six, to rely on God for the result of whatever you're doing. For example, your exams are coming. You give your best. You study the hardest you can. And then you pray with it. And then you leave the result in the hands of God, knowing that all results come from God. This is called tabakul, righteousness. Point number seven is to become just in Arabic. It is muqsid. The reason people don't want to execute justice is because a person will only not want to execute justice is when that justice is going to be against his own self or his mother, his parents, his wife, children, loved ones, dear ones, friends. That's when he doesn't want to execute justice. But when the same person executes justice, even if it is against his own self, his parents, his wife, children, friends, even against them. This is what God loves. This is called true justice. Number eight, and this is the second last point, third last, sorry, is to become a muttaqi. To make God your shield, ultimate shield. You do everything, but then you have this faith that you know what? At the end of the day, it is God that I rely on. You don't leave sin because of sin itself. You leave sin because God says leave it. You don't eat because you're hungry. You eat because God says eat. This is point number eight. And second last point that I wanted to cover is that you imitate God's attributes. God is creator. And in one way you're a creator too. When you get married through that union of yours, you have children. God is merciful. You can be merciful towards other people. God feeds us. You can choose to do the same thing. Razik. You can do the same thing for poor people. See, it was this point that Allah the Almighty told Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, more than 1400 years ago. He said, on the day of judgment, I'm going to look at one crowd of people and I will say to them, I was thirsty, I was hungry, I was naked, I was sick. When I was thirsty, you quenched my thirst. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I did not have clothes on me, you clothed me. And when I was sick, you came to visit me. And these people will say, God, how is that so? And God will say, my such and such servant was hungry and you fed him. My such and such servant was thirsty and you quenched his or her thirst. My such and such servant did not have clothes on him or her and you clothed him or her. And my such and such servant 
was sick and you visited him or her. And because of this, I forgive you. And then God will turn towards another crowd of people and he will say the same thing. I was thirsty, hungry, naked and sick and you did not care for me. And they will say, oh Lord, how is it possible that you be thirsty, you be hungry, that you be naked and you be sick. You're the Lord of everyone. And he will say the same thing. My people were thirsty. They were hungry. They were sick. They were naked and you did not care for them. So this day, I punish you. Lastly, is to contemplate. Contemplate on the ways on how to develop God's love that God has presented us in His Holy Scriptures. By contemplating on them and the nature that God has created, one can develop connection, one can develop love with God. And I end my today's discourse by presenting a mini excerpt from the founder of our community, the Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadiyan, upon whom be peace, alayhi salatu wa salam. He says, Dunya kahti hai tu kafir hai. The world says that you are a disbeliever. Magar kya tujh se piyara mujhe ko yor mil sakta hai? But I ask, is there someone who is more beloved than you? Agar ho to uski khatir mein tujhe chhod dun. Oh God, if someone is there who is more beloved than you, more dear than you, then I may leave you for him. لیکن میں تو دیکھتا ہوں کہ جب لوگ دنیا سے غافل ہو جاتے ہیں but I see that when people are unaware of what is happening in the world جب میرے دوستوں اور دشمنوں کو علم تک نہیں ہوتا کہ میں کس حال میں ہوں when my enemies and my friends have no idea in what condition I am in اس وقت تو مجھے جگاتا ہے you wake me up at that time اور محبت اور پیار سے فرماتا ہے and you say to me very kindly with love, Rab Naka, Matirisatni. Don't be sad. I am with you. To pair am mere mola. Then oh my friend, oh my lord. Ye kis tari mungkin hai kis asan ke hote huye. Pair me tujhe chhod do. Then oh my lord and oh my creator, how is it possible that I, after seeing these asan of yours, these good, these merciful bounties of yours how is it possible for me to leave you hargiz ne hargiz ne never ever never ever wa akhiru dawana ne alhamdulillah ya rabbi thank you very much mom sahib um, we will now get into uh, the q and a session i have been receiving some questions already so what i'll do is i'll pass on this uh, portable mic to the panel Uh, I already have seven questions here, eight questions here with me, so what I'll do is go through these questions first, and if you have a question downstairs, please come close to the um, mic, and then once we're done with these questions, we can go uh, to that list, and then similarly for Lejna, uh, you can say your question as well. So the first question we have is um, for the Christian faith, uh, so I'll request uh, Mr. Stephen if you could kindly answer this question for our members. Uh, the question is, um, if Jesus Christ uh, died for our sins, then, and then perhaps they're looking for some um, explanation here, then why do we need to go to church and how, and, and why do we really care to connect with God if Jesus Christ has already uh, died for our sins and we have attained that salvation, so to speak? This is a very uh, old question, actually. Uh, a lot of Christians ask this question, especially today. Um, part, part of the response is that Christ died for all of us as a community. Uh, and we need to respond as a community. Um, it's also true that we all have sinned and we need to have the fellowship of the saints, uh, which are the members of the church, to help us to deal with that. Um, and so, you know, quite regularly we meet and we have discussions of, of scripture to try to understand better and to pray uh, for one another. And, and uh, the, the truly observant 
uh, Christian who will also help brothers and sisters when they have uh, done something that's inconsistent with the faith. Um, my whole church right now is, for example, leaving uh, one denomination and going to another over questions of biblical integrity. And uh, we don't need to go into the details of that, but, but this is a very painful process of separation that we've gone through. It's taken us three years. Um, but it's required of us if we're going to be faithful uh, to um, the words that we've been given in the Bible and, and to the faith that we have in Christ. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for um, Mr. Ayer. The question is that uh, you stated that we are all gods. One of the fundamental attributes of God is to create. So are you implying that we as humans can create life out of nothingness? Uh, the purpose of uh, when we say we are all God, what I said was this say Atman, Paramatma. So then Let's say we have sun and we have different buckets of water. The reflection of sun comes on all waters. So the same way the Atman or the Paramatma has to reflect on every one of us. When we create our own, the next generation, they are also part of this uh, Paramatma. So how we get different birth, people we believe in you know, different birth. How it comes is, it's called Sanjita Karma. Whatever good deeds you did this, in this birth will be benefits for the next birth. Whatever you did bad will have, have a reflection on your next birth. So we carry that and if people has not done good deeds this, uh, this birth, that will have, have to pay one way or the other. Somebody was mentioning about that same thing, the karmas. You have to have the good deed, you have to carry the good deed. That's a kind of, not a bank balance kind of thing, but somehow or other you have to attain the God only through the good karma. So we respect others, we have to treat others with respect, and ahimsa, kausine paramatma. So dharma, and satyam vada dharmam chara, always tell the truth, and always do the dharma, which is good, good deeds. So that will take you to the you know, salvation or the attainment of reaching the ultimate God. Hopefully I answer that question. Yes, thank you. And then there's a follow-up uh, to that, uh, which is uh, if God is in all of us, um, you know, walking and, and talking within us, uh, why then we do, uh, we have weaknesses and why does God not correct us on the spot? And uh, in the Hindu faith, uh, you know, how do you address sin and, and getting rid of sin? Good question. So there are a lot of uh, scriptures which guide us how to do how to do dharma, how to lead our life. So there are you know, in every religion they have scriptures and they teach us how to do that. So the the next gen the so called next generation, I could see that I'm very glad that so much young generation sitting and listening to this. It is very important. We have to teach them how to get into this good life or doing good karmas in their life. There are a lot of scriptures in Hinduism and every religion has that kind of thing. So if we, if we can get into this younger generation to understand what is good and what is written on by the sages and by the different uh, sages and the people who have been born and teach us on different uh, good things, we need to follow them. That will be you know, respecting others and being peace on earth, that will take us in a long way. And people have to understand that how to interpret that one in a better way and doing good things to the society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next question we have uh, for Mr. Durji um, on, the, on Buddhism's uh, teaching. The question is that uh, in Buddhism, uh, we learn that one should not hurt any living soul, even insects. In light of this, how can we explain the current um, Buddhist government, which is committing atrocities against the uh, Ruhiya people in, uh, in um, Myanmar? 
And, and a follow-up question to that is, how do you also address some of the calamities that happen in the world from a Buddhist perspective? Uh, first of all, let me uh, address the first question. Uh, and I'm very aware of uh, these uh, situations in Myanmar, in the state of Raki. And uh, uh, some of uh, one well-known uh, Buddhist religious leader said it very well, I think. He said, if Lord Buddha is alive or if he is here today, uh, he will be weeping in front of those Buddhists in Burma. And uh, so, yeah, so this is, uh, 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 these actions in Myanmar, uh, uh, in, in Buddhism there are two major sects, the Mahayana and Harayana. So, uh, unfortunately the Dalai Lama do not have a uh, a say or control over those uh, sects or those uh, Buddhists. So the Dalai Lama has a, um, a leaderships, a tremendous follower and respect among the Tibetan Buddhists. Uh, and he is one of the champions of religious uh, harmony and uh, promotions of peace among different faiths. And he will never let uh, anything like that happen in front of his eyes. And so, what is happening in the Burma, uh, uh, these things, uh, the majority Buddhist uh, uh, committee atrocities against the minority Rohingya. Uh, it's very, very uh, sad, and it's very, very un-Buddhist uh, actions. And uh, so, uh, so they might have a, an explanation, and for me as a Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist, I really don't understand. So uh, any kind of atrocities in the name of religion is really unthinkable, and that's all I can say about it. So regarding the uh, the other natural calamities that's happening around the world, uh, earlier one of our friends said, uh, uh, Buddhist believes in karmas, law of causalities, and so uh, like uh, uh, we are what we have done in our past, and uh, what we will become in the future is dependent on our own actions today. So maybe some of the natural climates that affected uh, certain pockets of the uh, United States and around the world uh, in. In Buddhist uh, way of understanding, is this is a karma. This is a karma that uh, you are reading uh, the results of uh, something uh, sinful uh, actions or speech, body or mind that you might have committed. As uh, uh, we, it's not only in these lives. Uh, so it's uh, over many lives ago and many lives to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zurji. Uh, we have a question, John, I'll ask, uh, request you to address this question. Uh, this is again on the, uh, the topic of atonement. If God is compassionate and merciful, why do we need Jesus Christ's atonement to connect with God or achieve salvation? That's a good question. Uh, we believe that we can't, God is perfect and he's just. Right. So if I do something to my neighbor that hurts him, I can't fully compensate my neighbor for that. I can try to make it right, but I can't turn back time and really fix all the difficulty and pain that he suffered. So there has to be a way to make things just. So God is perfectly fair to every person, all his children. So we couldn't do that for ourselves. And so Christ came we believe that Christ came to fix that, to pay the penalty for sin that we could not pay. And so it's kind of connected to the first question a little bit because from, from the, LD, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints perspective, the reason you go to church and the reason that that's required in, in fasting and prayer and all those things are necessary is because repentance our, our progress to become 
what God wants us to become is conditioned on repentance. We have to do our part. Christ did his part, but now we have to do ours. And so Christ really fills the gap that we can't fill as mortals. And, and so that's it. The other part of that is, is that Christ also overcame physical death and was resurrected. And so that was a, another piece of that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, would you like to add anything to it or should we go to the next question? Part, part of what Christ did when he was alive with us uh, was uh, to die on the cross. But he also lived a righteous life, and we um, are to model ourselves after um, that life. Okay. That's a good point. Thank you. All right, there's a question uh, for our um, uh, sixth speaker, uh, John. Um, the, the question is, can you please explain or define uh, the word guru again? The word Guru, uh, Guru is the an enlightener. Right? Basically, whenever you, you you are going to school, there is a teacher, right? So you you may have science teacher, math teacher, but when you are going for spirituality, you need a guide who will guide you throughout the process of spiritual uh, realization of God. So that's that's the Guru. Guru teaches you the process, technology, techniques, resources, whatever you need to achieve the union with the God. That's the concept of Guru. Alright, thank you very much. Uh, we have you know, questions trickling in. There's a lot of interest right now in, uh, uh, in this panel and get the, the questions answered. So the, the next question again is uh, about um, the Hindu faith and it has to do with, let me read the, the direct question uh, about reincarnation and uh, let me go ahead and uh, lost track of my uh, uh, text messages here. Just give me a second please. Uh, so, th the, the question is uh, regarding reincarnation and how does it help us with connecting with God? Yes, we believe in uh, the incarnation of God in a different way. Whenever there is uh, a bad thing happens, the God will take the form of human being and will save us. I mean, we all heard about that in a different format, in this particular form. So, we believe that uh, the ultimate God Vishnu has taken ten for, uh, nine forms and the, the tenth will be coming sometime in the end of this Kali Yuga we call this. So whenever there is a bad things happening and uh, something bad to the dharma, dharma is righteous life. So anything happens to dharma, he will come as a savior and he will protect the dharma on this earth. So he has already completed nine ones and if we are waiting for the tent, we don't have any you know, exact date or anything like that. But we believe that that will happen. That is at the end of this world. So to have this savior incarnation is whenever there is adharm, the adharma, the, uh, the dharma's opposite called adharma, with predominance in this earth. So that to protect dharma, he will take a earth and will protect the universe to take care of us. Thank you very much. Again, a question uh, for the Christian faith. Uh, anyone can answer this. If God was to reveal himself in the form of Jesus, uh, what about the previous prophets like Noah, Abraham, uh, Lot, Adam, etc.? Would he not come in their form too? Um, of course, we have the, the testimony of, of all the prophets in, in the Bible. Um, and uh, they're all studied and, and venerated. Uh, but what's different about Christ is the coming down of God Himself, and, and that this is fundamental to our understanding. Um, uh, of course, the whole New Testament was written uh, after the re resurrection, and so everything in the New Testament uh, could be read as because Christ rose from the dead, therefore this is true. And, and so, um, 
when he walked on this earth, Jesus taught from the Hebrew Scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, and that's where the, these other prophets uh, are talked about. All right, thank you. Uh, Mom said we have a question for you. Um, the question is, God is merciful. How can he not love people who do... How can he not love people who do the ten undesirable deeds if he is uh, all loving or, or and all merciful? Allah Ta'ala says in the Holy Quran that he doesn't love such and such. That is not a stamp. That is not a seal that, okay, you know, this is it. The person is doomed. Allah Ta'ala also gives the person the opportunity to repent. The door to repentance, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned, is opened until death comes to you. Until that point, anybody can repent. Even the biggest of the sinners can repent. As a matter of fact, in a hadith, it is mentioned that once there was a man who had committed 98 murders. It's a very famous hadith. This man had committed 98 murders, and he suddenly had a change of heart, and he wanted to find God. So he came to a town, and he said, you know, where is the religious scholar that can guide me? So they sent him to a religious scholar, and he asked him, is there a chance for my salvation? He said, absolutely. He said, what have you done? He said, I've killed 98 people. He said, you crazy? There is no hope for you. Like, okay, if since there is no hope for you, might well commit another murder. So he killed that, you know, religious scholar. <laughs> Went to another person, another religious scholar, asked him, is there any hope for me? Met the same answer. He killed him too. Now he was at 100. He approached another town and another religious man. And he asked him, is there any hope for me? I've committed 99 murders or 100 murders. He said, absolutely. God is most forgiving, most merciful. You go to such and such town, and there is a man of God. You go and you be in his company, and he'll guide you how you can reach God. So he started walking in the direction of that town. And in the middle of the way, he died. Then came the angels. And the angels started to cuddle with each other. One group of angels were saying, this man was a sinner, he committed 100 sins. We're going to take his soul to hell. And another group of angels was saying, no, 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 this man had repented. Look, he was going towards the city of the righteous people. So he should be counted among those who have repented. And he should be taken to paradise. While this was happening, God spoke and gave his judgment. God said, measure the distance from this man's dead body to the distance of the city where he was going. And the distance from the city of the sinners that he was coming from. Whichever city he is closer to, he should be counted among a member of that city, either the city of the sinners or the city of the righteous people. So when the angels measured the distance by one inch, he was closer to the city of the righteous people. God forgive him. So we believe in the most forgiving God who looks for reasons to forgive us. So when God says that he doesn't love such and such, it is to actually imbibe in us a sense of remorse. That look, I have these problems, these spiritual vices. I need to do something about them now that I actually have the chance. Once I die, there is no hope. Thank you very much, Mom. So, uh, we have a question for uh, um, Sun Singh, our uh, speaker. Um, what is the concept of Tawheed or the unity of God in Sikhism and how do you explain that? Tawheed? Tawheed, yes. What's the do, you, do, do you believe in the unity of God in, in Tawheed? Uh, is that the, the question I had? One God. One God, yeah, unity of God, yes. Unity of God means the union of the soul with the God? No, no, one of God. One God? Yeah, one of God. Okay, got it. Basically, Sikhs believe that there is only one God. Like, one God means He is the sole creator of the whole creation. There is no anybody else who is creating. He is the same God who is the preserver of his creation. There is no separate God who creates or operates or destroys. Sikhs believe that there is only one God. He is the one who creates the creation. He is the one who takes care of the whole creation. 
He is the one who destroys the whole creation. This is the cycle. Like in everything, in the, in the natural you, uh, state of uh, affair, you can see that the things um, take birth, grow, and then gets destroyed. So the cycle, right? So similarly, whatever is happening, God has made such a system that whenever something is born, ultimately it will die. There is nothing which will stay here permanently. We are not permanent here. So at some time, regardless of how religious we are, how cruel we are, how bad or good we are, ultimately everything will die, will go from here. Jo aya, so chal. Guruji says, whoever came to this earth have to go at some time. So Guruji says that before you reach the grave, make sure you uh, do the efforts to connect with the Lord to connect with your creator. So that is the actual uh, actions of dharma. Dharma like, you do the righteous things, do the affirmative actions to meet God. So when you are doing those affirmative actions to meet God, and when you are living the righteous life, and uh, as we discussed before, like there are various stages, right? During the spiritual life you have various stages. So you will see that whatever you are achieving slowly, slowly at some point there will be uh, the stage you will uh, uh, receive the perfect union with the Lord. So the soul will merge with God and you will become one with God. And Guruji says that Ab to jaye chade singhasan chade hain mile hain sarang paani Ram Kabira ek pae hain koi na sake pashan. Kabir is the author of this. Kabir says that uh, he, when he received the perfect union with God, he says that Ab to jaye chade singhasan uh, Now I have reached the singhasan of the Lord. Singhasan is the seat of the Lord. Mile hai sarang pani. Sarang pani is the name of God. Kabir says that I have completely merged with God. I am one with God. Ram Kabira ek pae hai. Ram and Kabir both have become one. Koi na sakai pashan. Nobody can distinguish what is Kabir, what is God. Kabir became God, God became Kabir. That is the perfect union with God. Thank you very much. Um, the clock says 4 p.m. However, we do have uh, a one outstanding question here on my list, and then there's a lot of interest uh, in the audience that I can see, so we'll extend the time a little bit, and we'll try to end at 4.15 if that's okay um, with the folks here, but to just give people an opportunity to answer, uh, ask more questions. Uh, the question is uh, for um, John, if you could answer this, is Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit the same? Yes, uh, the answer to that is uh, from, from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint perspective, yes. It's often used um, uh, synonymously, although I will say that there's different references um, in, in context into the scriptures on when... Um, the, 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 the Spirit is referring to the Spirit of God versus the Holy Ghost. I guess in, in really answering that question, I would say that there are, we believe we believe that there are three separate persons: God the Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is also a personage, um, and so um, I. Uh, but but when we think of those terms, we think of the Holy Ghost. Thank you. And there's a question from the audience here. Hello, I have a question for Sant Singh Ji. Uh, Baba Guru Nanak Ji uh, performed Hajj in uh, Mecca. Why the other six communities not following the footsteps? Uh, Guru Nanak in his life, whenever Guru Nanak was in his physical body, Guru Nanak visited many places of pilgrimage. That is including uh, uh, the Hindu uh, places. Uh, Guru, Guru Nanak Dev visited Haridwar. Guru Nanak visited Puri, Jagannath Puri. Guru Nanak visited Makkah. Basically, the purpose was that enlightening the people. People were indulged in superstitious things. Wherever Guruji was going, he was teaching them that instead of doing all these uh, 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 like superstitious things, try to connect with God. Try to connect with God. So when, when Guru Nanak Dev Ji uh, went to Makkah, uh, Makkah and after that Baghdad, so the, uh, Baghdad there was a Peer Dastgir, 
ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਜੀ ਮੈਟ ਦਾ ਪੀਰ ਦਸਤ ਕੀਤੇ ਇਨ ਬੈਟਾ ਸੋ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਜੀ ਇਸ ਪਰਪਸ ਆਫ ਲਾ ਵਿਜ਼ਿਟਸ ਵਾਸ ਵੇਅਰ ਐਵਰ ਦੀ ਪੀਪਲ ਵਰ ਡੂਇੰਗ ਸਮਥਿੰਗ ਰੋਂਗ ਸੋ ਹੀ ਵਾਂਟਡ ਟੂ ਪੁੱਟ देम ਔਨ ਦਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਪਾਥ ਸੋ ਦੈਟ ਵਾਸ ਦੀ ਪਰਪਸ ਆਫ ਹਿਸ ਵਿਜ਼ਿਟਸ ਇਸ ਨਾਟ ਓਨਲੀ ਮੱਕਾ देयर आर वेरियस प्लेसेस इन इंडिया लाइक इन गुरु नानक देव जी वाज इन पंजाब एंड फ्रॉम पंजाब ही वेंट ऑल द वे टू असम लाइक ईस्ट इंडिया दैट इज लाइक अबाउट 1500 माइल्स एंड देन ही वेंट ऑल द वे साउथ टू श्रीलंका दैट्स अगेन 1500 माइल्स एंड देन ही केम अप टू नॉर्थ इन इन बगदाद एंड देन मक्का मदीना सो गुरु नानक देव जी इज पर्पस ऑफ विजिट्स वाज दैट फॉर गुरु गुरु जी वांटेड टू गिव द मैसेज टू एज मेनी पीपल एज पॉसिबल दैट वाज द पर्पस दिस हिज पर्पस वाज नॉट लाइक हाजी ही वाज नॉट ए हाजी सो द पर्पस वाज टू शोइंग द पीपल द राइट वे टू थैंक यू वेरी मच आई विल गो अप स्टेयर्स टू टू लेजना डू यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस एनीवन वुड लाइक टू बिकॉज़ आई हैव यस प्लीज have a question from um the Lajna side uh for Mr. Ayer. Yes, please go ahead. Um and uh basically our member wants to ask um what is the concept of reincarnation uh, in your faith? Uh reincarnation is uh how we do in uh support or we believe in incarnation is uh there's a famous quote from Bhagavad Gita यदा यदा हि धर्मस्य ग्लानि भवदि भारता अभ्युत्थान मदम्मस्य सदात्मानं सजाम्यहं परित्राणाय साधूना विनायशाय दुष्कृतां कर्म संस्थापनार्थाय संभवामि युगे युगे द लास्ट सेंटेंस आई वुड ट्रांसलेट कर्म संस्थापनार्थाय संभवामि युगे युगे टू टेक केयर ऑफ द धर्म इन दिस अर्थ आई विल बॉन्ड अगेन एंड अगेन ही द अल्टीमेट गॉड knows that when there is not dharma happening in this world so it can it it can be a birth of any form we don't know what kind of form he will take it it uh, uh, we started from you know the fish and ended in the krishna avatar so we started a uh, briefly just one minute started from fish then it uh, went to tortoise then it went to you know uh, pig then it was say uh, Uh, both, both human and a lion form then we went to a human form with a small three feet then we went to a human form who has an axe then you have the another human form which you took it is with a plow and then was the krishna the last one so he has taken different incarnation to protect the righteous of the earth so incarnation is we as a human being we may not know when this righteous thing is going in a bad condition at this moment we in hindus believe that there is no the uh, dharma is still the that is why we have sitting here and talking a good things about the god so we believe that there is still a good righteous people sitting in front of us and listening in some word that they are believe in god and they do the right thing to the human beings so at this moment we don't believe that adharma or the act, the opposite part of dharma has come into the place of where the god has to take incarnation when the time comes it will definitely come and take a part okay yes please yes sir uh i think the uh, reincarnation is also a concept that buddhist uh, strongly believe and uh, what they say is that uh, uh, all human beings uh, have that buddha nature we have a potential to attain enlightenment and buddhahood so until we do to we do that we are reborn and die we reborn we live in this world of samsara and so our cycle of birth uh, it, uh, stops only when we uh, achieve nirvana or buddha buddhahood so that's what we say thank you very much uh, any other questions from the lady side Okay any questions from the men side Yes please Uh so we have one more question from Rajesh uh, side Ji uh, ladies I'll I'll come back to you guys we have one question downstairs and then we'll go to you For the uh Aki could you please come up here This is a 
question for the Imam. Um, in your ninth precept, I noticed that you read a story that uh, we as Christians are familiar with, and I'll read it for you. It says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left, and then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. And I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick and you visited me, I was in prison, and you came to me. And then he says to the righteous the same thing. So the question is, I'm curious, is this part of the Quran, or is this a religious Christian text that you have uh, become familiar with and incorporated into your narrative? This comes in a hadith, uh, which are a collection of the sayings of Father Muhammad, peace be upon him. Just like at the time of Christ, he mentioned of narrations from previous prophets, um, which the Jewish Talmud also has. Similarly, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned about things, uh, you know, stories that are common uh, in our scriptures, stories that are common in your scriptures, stories that are common with the uh, Hindu scriptures, and even your scriptures. So this is a narration that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, based on what God himself had told him. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had learned of this from a Christian that existed in his time, in his area. It simply means that the person, the being, who taught Prophet Muhammad about this, is the same being who taught Christ about this, or who taught other prophets about this. Christians call him Holy Father, Jews call him Yahweh, we call him Allah. Exactly. So we have um, a time for one last question, and I'll go um, to the lady's side to ask that question, please. My question is to the Panditji. Um, if your Vedas speak about Ishwar being one and unseen, why the idols are worshipped then? Yes, uh, the that's idols a, that you've created yourself. Yeah, uh, that's what my was uh, talking about. The idol is a form which we can. Uh, we are not idol worshippers, Hindus. That's a misconception. So we work. We head to God through a idol. So we want to have a form to worship. You can take any form. Sometimes we take a elephant's head form. Sometimes we are taking a, a snake form. We take what you, we believe that you feel comfortable with whatever way which you want to pray to the God. So people can take a stone and put it, this is my God. I am going to worship. But the God is only one. Everybody is a God. We believe that there is a God in that stone also. So there is nothing. We are not a idol worshippers. People get confused with that. Hinduism, idol worship. No. We worship a God through that. We put pictures on our prayer room. We believe that oh, there's the God might be in that form. It is easy. When people become a guru, as uh, Sanji was mentioning about, when they may not need at that time a picture or an idol to worship because they understand the God at that time. So when to reach that stage, we might need a help. So that is the idol which we use it so that we believe that, okay, this is the form. Some people might be worship that idol as to get the knowledge. Some people worship that to get the wealth. Different ways which we can pray to God that that is the idol which we can. I can take a stone from this uh, uh, parking lot and say, this is my God, I can pray it that way. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for all the questions and uh, very active participation, and thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, we're coming to the end of this session now. Um, I have uh, two quick announcements. Uh, the first announcement is for the congregation here for us, uh, that the uh, survey for the mosques and extension has been sent out. Please fill out that survey by tonight. Even if you have made the pledge before, still please fill out the survey and send it out uh, by tonight, please. 
the other announcement is for the refreshments. We'll have the refreshments now right after this program downstairs. Uh, so please uh, proceed there. And last thing is, um, we have a tradition to uh, begin our sessions with the recitation of the Holy Quran and end the sessions with a prayer. So uh, speakers can choose in your own way. You can pray and I, we will all pray in our way. And uh, I will request respected Imam uh, Faran Rabbani Saab to please lead us in silent prayers and others can participate in whichever way you feel comfortable. Um, 